Ni hao, and welcome to episode three of my Mao's China vlog. And this time I think about the political establishment of the People's Republic of China. So in the last episode, we looked at how the Communist Party, having won the civil war, uh, or declared victory in the civil war in October uh, 1949, and then went on to gain physical control uh, of China, uh, the whole of China, through using the People's Liberation Army um, and the suppression of various kind of campaigns against opposition. Uh, even in the east of China. This episode is much more focused on the political control of China and how they established a structure of government that allowed the Communist Party to be dominant, and in particular, uh, Mao himself at the top of that party to be in control. So it's worth mentioning at the start, uh, that the Communist Party had 5.8 million members by the end of 1950, so it's a big party. Uh, by perhaps Western European standards, but still within China, it's quite a small slice um, of the population. And for that reason, it needed to find a way that was um, efficient and also effective uh, at controlling the country um, and making sure that no other political opposition could spring up and oppose it. So uh, in 1949, they established the what was called the Common Programme for China. And this was um, in place of a con constitution, a temporary constitution. And this ran from 1949 through to 1954, uh, when the, the actual um, constitution of the People's Republic of China was first put in place that's there today with some slight amendments. And the Common Programme for China gave rights to lots of people, including gender equality, it gave the right of educational opportunity to all people, it protected religious belief. Some of these things sound better uh, written down than they actually appeared in practice. But crucially, it also made Mao the head of state um, and allowed rights, for instance, of the police to crush opponents of communism. So right from the start, there's a sense in which this is going to be a totalitarian state where total power is in the hands of the Communist Party and uh, de facto in the hands of Mao as chairman of that party. In fact, Mao is at the top of a structure. It's probably a good idea to try and um, find a diagram of this uh, structure of power um, or some other YouTuber who is um, not as lazy as me and actually has uh, graphics on their, uh, on their little vlogs. Um, but if you imagine Mao at the top of the structure on his own and then underneath him, three strands. One is the Communist Party, one is the state and one is the army, the PLA, the People's Liberation Army. All three of those strands answer to him. And the party was, uh, their role was to create policy for the country. The state's role was to put that policy in place, to implement that policy. And the army's role was to enforce that policy. So each strand has its own kind of um, uh, reason for being there and its own job in, in the system. But Mao kind of glues that all together at the top. Also, organisationally, China was divided into six bureaux. Uh, each of those part, uh, each of those bureaux had a chairman, a party secretary, uh, so a political and a party um, representative, and then a military commander and a political commissar. These last two, the military commander, fairly obviously, but also the political commissar, are both PLA appointments. And this shows the dominance or the influence of the army, particularly at the start, perhaps right from the start, that Mao knew, in fact, Mao said, didn't he, that all power comes out the barrel of a gun, that the, the army were going to be key to imposing communist rule. So in terms of the political structure um, of, of, the, of the country, underneath um, Mao and the, the sort of headline organisations, the Politburo is the top political organ of the Communist Party. So remember, the Communist Party are the ones that are going to create policy and decide what needs to be done, what should happen in the PRC. So they're the key decision making body. Mao is chairman of the party and chairman, therefore, of the Politburo. But actually, Mao tries to stay uh, above and outside of discussions wherever possible, partly so that he can kind of avoid blame later on. Nevertheless, the Politburo can't make any decisions that Mao disagrees with. Underneath the, well, alongside the Politburo um, are, uh, is the top state body, the National People's Congress. But even though that's kind of the, the top of the government, they uh, are just the, the body that, that rubber stamps the decisions that the Politburo makes. So party power is 
is everything here, that Mao and the party are dominant, the state organs are ones that are just there to take what the party wants and to put it into practice to make it happen. So they rubber stamp the policy decisions. And like in the Soviet Union, um, lots of people had um, more than one role uh, in the state and the party. So uh, an example of this is Peng or Peng, um, Peng De Hui, the Minister of Defence, was also the commander in chief of the PLA. For any doubt, Peng is spelled P-E-N-G. However, there is also um, the idea within this system of democratic centralism. And that's the idea that power trickles upwards. So um, underneath these top rank organs, um, like the Politburo, there's the central committee and then regional committees and then local committees. And the idea is that the voice of the peasant or the local worker can be heard in his local communist party um, uh, meetings and uh, organization and then as they elect someone to their regional level as the regional elects someone to the national level and as the national make it on the politburo that those ideas and comments and thoughts can be filtered upwards so that's the democratic idea and the centralism idea is that actually power is at the center um, democratic centralists, those proponents of it, would say that even though power is at the centre, there is this ability to, to feed into that and encouraged feed, ability to feed into that. In practice, in China, it doesn't really work like that. However, the local um, groups do play a key role. So the party cadres at a local level are monitoring schools and the legal system and the civil service and even the PLA to check that they are doing what the Communist Party wants. And so you kind of do have this democratic, um, everyone's uh, part of the system role, but not in a traditional feeding ideas into and up the, um, the ladder of decision-making. Mao's position at the top uh, of both the party and the state um, are never under threat, uh, never under threat, probably, um, but, um, it's a truism that the more um, secure his position became, um, the more remote Mao became from the ordinary people, even though he kind of went on train journeys and um, campaigns around the country. Actually, these were very sort of carefully managed so that he didn't meet ordinary people. Um, and he became more detached from other leaders as well. Um, and a kind of like a, a new emperor, you sometimes see that phrase, that you know, back at the start of the 20th century, China had an emperor, they knew how that worked, and they were quite separate than the people um, and very remote. And Mao sort of becomes seen a bit like this. And in that position, that Mao became paranoid about threats uh, and rivals. So for instance, um, a couple of good examples here, in 1954, Mao accused Gao Gang, um, who is CCP leader in Manchuria, um, Gao is G-A-O, sorry about his first name, uh, and Rao Shushi, Rao Shushi uh, the CCP leader in Shandong, that goes well, doesn't it? Shushi Shandong, and um, Rao is R-A-O, so Gao from Manchuria and Rao from Shandong, uh, the Communist Party, Communist Party leaders there, just to emphasize that, Communist Party leaders within the party are both accused of establishing independent kingdoms and both are dismissed from their positions as a result. Gao actually ends up killing himself um, because of the humiliation and the, the shame that is uh, imposed upon him. And these are uh, both uh, things happen there because of Mao's paranoia um, and sensitivity. This is uh, actually increased in 1956 when the Congress, the Party Congress, passed a resolution confirming that government was a collective rather than an individual um, activity. Now, this fitted completely the narrative that was put about in China and uh, the narrative that suits Mao, if anything goes wrong, is that it's a collective exercise. Um, but, of course, it seems to also undermine uh, Mao's individual status. And so Mao was quite troubled by this. Potentially innocent mistake. Even worse than that, though, Peng Dehui, who we've mentioned before, the Minister of Defence and the PLAC uh, Commander in Chief, he proposed um, that they, they remove reference to Mao Zedong thought as the inspiration of the Communist Party. Now, I'm not 
entirely sure what his motivation was for that, but that's a slightly more uh, blundersome move, I would suggest, on Peng's part. Um, and Mao was perhaps more likely, more obviously worried about this challenge to his authority. Situations like this led to what was known as the Hunt of Flowers campaign. So in 1956, also, um, I should note that we haven't talked about the economy yet, but the economy was doing all right through the first five-year plan. Um, and in fact, in some ways, it's done pretty well. But Mao wanted to some reflection on how things could go even better. So in 1956, Mao decides that actually now is the time to allow greater freedom of press for constructive comments uh, on the progress of the People's Republic of China. Um, and he basically puts it out there that although the first five-year plan had gone well, and the, some Communist Party officials has perhaps been a bit over-enthusiastic, over-indulgent, um, or clumsy, perhaps, in, in applying those policies. And he was suggesting that actually there was room now for intellectuals to contribute to the debate and critique what was happening. Maybe hoping for tips, maybe hoping for Communist Party officials who weren't completely loyal to be um, highlighted and shopped out so that he could avoid things like it happened at the Communist Party Congress uh, the year before, particularly Gao and Rao, who had been maybe developing their own kingdoms. Uh, and Mao makes this comment that a uh, hundred flowers should be allowed to bloom. He says, let a hundred schools of thought contend. Now, there's a lot of debate about whether how much Mao meant this, whether Mao meant this as a trap, whether he meant this to actually happen, or whether perhaps he was feeling so smug about how things were going that he was just expecting people to go, oh, no, Mao, you're great. You just carry on. It's very unclear. What is clear is that people were reluctant to say very much because of the um, three antis and five antis campaigns and the Lao guy was kind of stuffed full of opposition. So A, quite a lot of opposition had been removed and B, people knew what would happen if you did speak out. But over time, through a bit of coaxing, there is some criticism of individuals um, and policies. Um, it's possible here that Mao was also trying to poke the Communist Party into being more revolutionary and more bold in the future. Uh, what sort of things that are, are criticised are corruption and inefficiency, a lack of realism in some of the targets that have been set. And there's even some mild criticism of Mao himself. I should emphasise that it is mild criticism of Mao, um, but nevertheless, there is some there. Very quickly, at this point, Mao calls a halt to the whole 100 Flowers campaign and instead replaces it with an anti-rightist repression. And all these people that had uh, criticised um, are um, dealt with, uh, Mao calls this squeezing the pus out of an abscess, uh, in his delicate phrasing. Um, teachers and scientists, uh, economics, economists, economists and artists are all rounded up, people that are criticised and tested off against the Communist Party or mildly critical of the Communist Party, um, and they are um, put in Lao Gai, um, dismissed from their posts, um, and generally um, just kind of punished for what they had said, what they'd been invited to say. Um, estimates vary between about half a million and three quarters of a million people are um, affected this way. Even uh, Zhou Enlai, Zhou remember is spelled uh, counterintuitively Z-H-O-U, um, Zhou Enlai, the foreign minister, uh, was obliged to self-criticise, and this is uh, quite important actually, he admitted publicly before a big uh, a big meeting of party members he admitted to putting Mao's industrialization plans into action too slowly um, which was completely untrue uh, Joe was kind of having to make this up to self-criticize himself um, because of Mao's paranoia and pressure upon him nevertheless what this shows was how uh, the, the extent um, and depth of Mao's power and influence that he was able to make such a figure as Joe um, do this. So uh, what you have then by the mid 50s is, or late 50s, I guess, 1957, the Hundred Flowers campaign, uh, is that Mao is completely in charge uh, of China. Um, he's completely a, a, a dominant force, politically untouchable, unchallengeable, and the Communist Party are equally unchallengeable as well, that other parties have been um, removed and dismissed. Um, and even if people speak out, even if they're invited to speak out, that they can be dealt with and removed afterwards. So the consolidation of power, the establishment of the PRC is very effective politically. 
Now, just in finishing, uh, the, remember that you can get a source question on this sort of thing. So um, it's, you are unlikely to be asked to explain how Mao's power structure worked, but it is possible that you can get a source with reference to the um, the Congress or the Politburo or, or different organs of bodies. So do make sure that you're kind of aware, particularly the top body is there. And then also um, the sort of essay questions you're likely to get would be focusing on the PRC's establishment perhaps asking you the significance of the structure of power or the significance of parts of this um, or of Mao within that structure of power. The ideal one, I would say, would be one that asks you whether you know, this political bit is the most important element uh, in their uh, causation of the, uh, the PRC being established, in which case you can compare it to the military um, and the um, perhaps suppression of opposition as well, which would be quite nice. Um, but uh, they can be quite specific. So do watch out for that and make sure you know exactly what you're talking about here. Uh, anyway, I hope that's useful. Next time we're going to think about the Korean War um, and I'll see you then.